Hello, my name is Raymond Alvarez, and I am co-founder of i Biologics, as well as an assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, and first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak about um, uh, some of the things I've been doing over the last several years involving FC gamma receptor signaling uh, during viral infections. Uh, so I think this subject is quite pertinent in the environment that we're currently in. Um, so as you all well know, at the end of last year, um, there was a uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic uh, outbreak that currently uh, has infected 24.2 million people worldwide with 5.8 million people in the U.S. Um, currently, the mortality rates are running at 3.5% worldwide and 3.1% in the U.S. And so uh, the urgency of this pandemic has sent um, scientists racing to develop vaccines that elicit um, neutralizing antibody responses. Um, in parallel, other researchers are focusing on developing antibody-based um, therapeutics that can be passively infused into acutely infected individuals. So um, I think this has put um, a spotlight on antibodies. Um, although the emphasis has mostly been placed on the neutralizing capacity of antibodies, whereby the antibody targets uh, the viral antigen that interacts with the host receptor, uh, thereby preventing um, permissive uh, or infection into permissive target cells. However, uh, the back half of the antibody also has um, functional properties. So the antibody is a bifunctional uh, molecule whereby uh, the back half, the FC constant region, mediates non-neutralizing antibody responses. And the way this uh, occurs is that the antibody is able to recognize either viral particles or virus-infected cells. And then the FC portion, the constant region of the antibody, then interacts with FC receptors on the surface of innate immune effector cells. This interaction then causes um, such effector responses as antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, phagocytosis, and cytokine production. So um, these responses are mediated by a family of FC receptors, and in particular, the family that recognizes IgG antibodies are FC gamma receptors. And so what happens is that once an uh, antibody antigen complex is detected by these FC receptors, they become cross-linked. And so um, this family of FC gamma receptors uh, consists of six um, activating and inhibitory receptors. And um, because of their different affinities, as well as their ability to both activate and inhibit um, uh, effector responses, um, they modulate the immune system in response to um, uh, pathogens. So... Um, Two, uh, there are two primary uh, pro-inflammatory FC gamma receptors, which is FC gamma 2 and FC gamma 3, and they mediate a lot of antibody effector functions. And so um, these effector functions are ADCC, as I mentioned, where uh, an effector population detects um, an antibody-optimized infected cell and then releases a perforin and granzyme to kill that cell. Um, antibody-optimized cells can also be detected by... Um, uh, phagocytic cells, which are like macrophages, which end up phagocytosing and killing um, infected cells. And also, um, antibody antigen complexes can be um, taken up by dendritic cells, um, the antigen then being processed and presented to the cellular arm of the immune system. Um, so all of this uh, can mediate the expression of cytokines, which further dictates the environment in which an immune response is um, conducted. And so uh, further regulation of FC receptor interactions are mediated by um, the different subclasses of IgG antibodies. And here you can see IgG 1 through 4. And so depending on what subclass is targeting the antigen, you'll get subtle regulation of FC receptor interactions. Um, adding to this regulation is the potential glycosylation that occurs in the FC region of the antibody. And um, you can see here the variety of glycosylation patterns that can occur, which add to the potential compl uh, complexity and subtlety of disease regulation. Um, another variable um, is cell type. And so you can see here that um, FC receptor expression is target cell dependent. So you have quite a variety of different types of effector populations that express different levels of, um, of FC receptors, and um, they're 
expression can vary to pay, uh, depending on tissue localization. So all of these factors contribute to um, FC regulation of immune responses. So antibody affinity, subclass, glycosylation, epitope targeting, and avid avidity as well as multivalency. So all of these factors uh, contribute to um, how uh, FC receptors orchestrate the immune response. So you can see how complex and how subtle um, the system is in terms of being able to regulate immune responses. So um, now I'd just like to turn our attention to um, how potential or how FC receptor signaling has been shown to be involved in uh, viral infections. And so in the context of influenza, um, we can see here the hemagglutinin uh, envelope protein. Um, it consists of a globular head as well as a stalk region. And um, researchers have found that anti-hemagglutinin uh, um, antibodies that are directed against the globular head actually have very efficient neutralization, um, but they have very poor FC gamma receptor activation. This is good for strain-specific responses. So we get seasonal flu, and it responds to that particular strain. However, recent developments have identified um, antibodies that target the stalk region of um, hemagglutinin. And what these antibodies do is uh, they also can mediate um, neutral neutralizing and non-neutralizing responses. However, these non-neutralizing responses can um, recruit uh, effector cells and um, mediate more effective immune responses. Um, what's uh, interesting about these anti-stalk antibodies is that they're broadly reactive. So the regions in the stock are more conserved amongst more strains. So um, the uh, basis for a universal influenza vaccine um, is developing around uh, eliciting these uh, anti-stock, broadly reactive antibodies um, to then generate a um, universal influenza vaccine. So um, other evidence of the importance of FC gamma receptor signaling in um, viral infections come from um, the field of HIV, where um, the first clinical trial to show um, uh, protection from the acquisition of HIV also uh, came up with the first immune correlates with protection. And those correlates um, were not neutralizing antibodies, nor were they um, cellular um, responses. Um, what protection did correlate with were high titers of non-neutralizing antibodies, particularly against the V1, V2 region of the HIV envelope, so um, the crown region of um, HIV OMV. And um, these non-neutralizing antibodies seem to mediate higher um, ADCC responses against the virus. So further evidence of FC receptor uh, involvement in the in vivo control of HIV comes from um, my own work in at Mount Sinai, where we examined um, uh, a cohort of viremic controllers that had viral loads below 1,000 to undetectable levels in comparison to um, HIV chronically infected patients. And what we observed was that um, while um, viremic controllers and chronically infected individuals had similar anti-HIV envelope um, levels um, and also similar levels of uh, neutralization activity, um, what we did find was that they had, uh, that HIV controllers had an enhanced uh, capacity to mediate um, FC gamma 2 and FC gamma 3 signaling. Um, so what this is uh, showing is that um, while the quantitative aspects of uh, antibody responses in both these populations are fairly similar, meaning that the titers are very similar. Um, the qualitative responses seem to be different in that um, since HIV controllers mediate higher levels of FC gamma receptor signaling, uh, this potentially implies that um, they're mediating, um, this is contributing to more effective immune responses in vivo. So further evidence of the involvement of FC receptor um, uh, involvement in HIV comes from studies examining broadly neutralizing antibodies, where um, in this case, um, the broadly neutralizing B12 had the uh, had its FC region ablated. Um, and then uh, this antibody was passively infused into macaques and infected with um, SHIV models of infection. Um, with a wild-type antibody, what you see here is that it maintains both neutralization as well as FC receptor function, and it pretty much controls um, virus replication in vivo. 
However, once you remove the um, FC, uh, the ability of this antibody to interact with FC receptors, you then um, lose this uh, ability to control virus replication in vivo. Another example of this comes from um, the uh, another broadly neutralizing antibody, BNC117, where um, experiments with this antibody that also uh, knock out FC receptor function or further optimize it to enhance FC receptor activity um, uh, was examined in models of humanized mouse models of HIV infection. And so um, here we can see that um, in comparison to wild type, um, the monoclonal antibodies that maintain neutralizing function but have um, their FC ab interaction ability deleted have higher levels of infection as compared to wild type. And uh, the converse is true for um, antibodies that have enhanced FC interaction where they have a little bit um, less infection as compared to wild type. This is further um, corroborated with the viral loads where the uh, FC optimized um, antibody mediates uh, or uh, we see significantly lower levels of um, viral loads in these animals. So um, while uh, FC receptor uh, responses seem to be very uh, important for controlling uh, virus infections in vivo, that's not always the case in every single type of virus infection. In fact, in um, dengue infection, there are four serotypes of dengue infection. And what happens is that you get initial primary infection with one serotype. You then develop an immune response against this serotype. And then the danger then comes in with um, infection with a secondary uh, serotype of dengue. Um, this reactivates your memory response, but your memory response has been set by your primary infection. So this leads to an inefficient control of the secondary serotype infection. Um, this causes elevations in um, anti-IgG uh, responses against dengue, which uh, correlates with the severity of disease and de dengue hemorrhagic fever. So um, this caused an uh, initial hypothesis that maybe the um, antibodies themselves were exacerbating disease. Um, and studies further showed this um, to be true, where in vitro studies have shown that anti-dengue antibodies mediated enhanced entry and infection of leukocytes, and this is via uh, FC receptor-mediated uptake. Um, further, in vivo studies have shown that uh, polyclonal sera from severe uh, dengue, severely infected dengue individuals or uh, monoclonal um, antibodies mediate pathogenic effects. Um, and further clinical studies have also shown that um, severe dengue is, uh, is correlated with enhanced FC gamma-3 um, signaling. In particular, um, a particular glycosylation state um, is associated with that. Um, moreover, uh, enhanced uh, polymorphisms that enhance FC gamma receptor detection of antibodies have further been correlated with disease severity. So we can see how the regulation of FC receptors may be very important for disease. So we wanted to begin to look at what FC receptor signaling looked like in SARS-CoV-2. And so um, there have already been uh, immune profiles of mild versus severe patients. And what's been found is that in mild COVID-19, what we see is a uh, initial upregulation of type 1 interferon, which is our body's uh, way of alerting that there is a, a viral infection um, occurring, and it activates uh, lots of uh, interferon-stimulated genes, um, which act to um, counteract uh, virus replication. So in mild disease, you have this peak of type 1 interferon, which um, you have some level of replicating virus, which then begins to get controlled. Um, you have lower levels of inflammation, and this coincides with um, less disease severity. Whereas in severe COVID-19 disease, um, you have a delay of type 1 interferon responses um, where you have uh, earlier phases of uncontrolled virus replication. And 7 to 10 days after um, the onset of symptoms, you then get um, escalating uh, inflammation and disease severity. So what these um, uh, inflammation coincides with is what has been um, deemed uh, cytokine storms, um, but really what this is is an elevated profile of specific cytokines, um, mainly TNF, IL-6, and IL-8. Um, these 
inflammatory cytokines and this increased inflammation and disease severity also coincides with increasing levels of anti-spike um, IgG. This has led researchers to speculate that um, potentially ADE is involved in um, these responses. So uh, other evidence of potential ADE in um, coronavirus infections comes from SARS-1, where in vitro studies have shown that um, anti-spike antibodies for against SARS-1 mediates higher levels of virus entry into target cells. Um, this is called um, uh, antibody-dependent enhanced infection. Further evidence comes in vivo, um, where either through passive um, infusion of anti-spike antibodies or vaccine-induced anti-spike antibodies cause more acute lung injury and cytokine expression in uh, macaque models of infection. The caveat to this, though, is that um, in monkey models, there is a resolution of infection. Um, and this resolution of infection or the decrease in viral titers coincide with um, uh, the lung injury uh, phenotype and it resolving as well. Um, a further caveat to the in vitro data here is that while um, increases, while uh, antibodies increase entry into uh, macrophages and monocytes, the population thought to cause the elevated cytokine expression, um, monocytes and macrophages do not productively become infected with SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. So to begin to kind of clarify whether the involvement of FC receptor um, signaling in COVID-19, we gathered a cohort of convalescent individuals. Um, these individuals were um, antibody positive or antibody negative. There were 28 antibody positive, 28 20 antibody negative. Um, they were uh, sex and age matched fairly well. Um, importantly, um, the time from which we there was an onset of symptom in these patients, the time we drew blood was approximately 43 days. That was the median for the population. And this is very important in that um, 43 days is optimal since you don't want to get a too early of a time point where uh, IgG levels have not peaked yet and you don't want to get too late of a time point where IgG levels begin to wane. Um, we've also collected uh, blood type data on uh, all of our donors, as well as uh, under any underlying conditions in these individuals. So the first thing that we wanted to do was assess their anti-spike antibody levels. And we used this using a cell-based system, whereby we transfected 293Ts with the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. This then expresses the protein on its surface and allows for a detection by donor-derived um, IgG. This IgG was purified IgG from these convalescent donors. We then come in with an anti-human IgG um, antibody that has a fluorescence marker on it, and we can then detect the level of, um, of antibodies via fluorescence uh, flow cytometry. So we can see here that we have very little background on a negative sample, um, whereas even with low samples, we get um, good resolution and detection. Um, this is true also for samples that have intermediate levels of anti-spike binding, as well as high levels of anti-spike binding. So in, you can see here that the resolution of the assay um, is very good where uh, the negative uh, sera is giving us about a two log difference between uh, the lowest positive sample that we see here. Um, and we have about a two log resolution between the lowest um, COVID-2 positive sample, antibody uh, positive sample, and the highest. We can further see uh, a breakdown of this uh, here where you see the spectrum of um, anti-spike antibody levels in these convalescent individuals. Importantly, in these four individuals with red arrows, um, they actually tested negative on commercial tests. Um, these tests are normally, uh, these were ELISA-based um, tests, and they actually uh, said that these individuals were negative. However, um, we were able to pick them up with our assay, which is um, evidence that our assay is very sensitive, um, even detecting low levels. And since we have a two-log difference between real negative samples and low-level positive samples, we're fairly confident at these results. Also, these individuals did also test pos PCR positive for um, SARS-CoV-2. 
So we also collected uh, symptomology um, uh, of these in infected individuals. And so you can see here the list of symptoms attached to a severity score. We asked um, each of our uh, donors to self-report um, the severity of each of these symptoms. What this allowed us to do is come up with a composite uh, total severity score for each individual. While each individual did not have every single one of these symptoms, they had a various array of symptoms and we could add those scores up to a total composite score. When we did that and compared that to the anti-spike levels, we saw that the cohort um, pretty much divided into um, mild versus moderate in scores that were above 45 and below 45. So we then used this to look at anti-spike levels and saw that the anti-spike levels were significantly higher in um, individuals that had severity scores of above 45. So um, next, we wanted to assess the level of FC gamma receptor signaling in these convalescent individuals. And we again expressed SARS-CoV-2 and incubated with uh, donor-derived IgG, except this time we co-cultured um, these cells with reporter cell lines that expressed FC receptor cells on their surface. Um, upon uh, IgG detection, these cells cross-link FC receptor, causing um, a signaling to occur and luciferase production. We then can detect luciferase production as a surrogate marker for level of FC activation. So in doing this, we see that there is enhanced um, FC gamma 2 and FC gamma 3 in uh, convalescent donors with severity scores above 45. Further, when we looked at the level of FC gamma uh, signaling in contrast to the level of CoV-2 antibody binding, we found a significant correlation. However, with FC gamma 3, this correlation was very striking. It seemed um, almost like a completely linear correlation where the level of um, anti-spike antibody um, very well correlated with the level of FC gamma receptor signaling. So what this implies, at least with this uh, small uh, cohort of convalescent individuals, is that FC gamma receptor signaling goes up in proportion with the level of anti-spike antibodies. Um, so this was very nice in a, a, a set of convalescent individuals. However, we wanted to see how this was reflected in the hospitalized population. And through a collaboration with Sarab Mahandru of Mount Sinai, uh, we were able to get a handful of um, hospitalized individuals. Um, we also looked at their level of anti-spike binding. And what you can see here is the level of anti-spike binding in low versus high individuals. And we also see here what it looks like in a severe IgG individual. And you can see how uh, there's a marked elevation in the level of anti-spike antibody binding. When we graph um, our convalescent cohort in uh, comparison to hospitalized individuals, we see that there's a very significant elevation in anti-spike antibodies in hospitalized, severe and hospitalized individuals. And this is almost a log, um, uh, a log, full, uh, a log higher as compared to the mean of uh, our convalescent cohort. When we further divide the level of anti-spike um, antibody levels in uh, those with severity scores below 45, above 45, and as compared to the severe and hospitalized individuals, you see this clear stair step in the level of anti-spike antibody. So we next, um, having seen this elevation in anti-spike, um, even beyond our cohort, our convalescent cohort levels, we wanted to see what the level of FC gamma receptor activation was in these patients. And what we observed was with FC gamma 2, we did see a trend towards significantly higher FC gamma 2, and we did see significantly higher FC gamma 3 activation. Um, so it does look as if um, both anti-spike and FC gamma receptor activation um, correlates with severity of COVID-19. So what we have here is we're left with the question of are there likely ADE effects in COVID-19? And what we've observed is an increase in the titers of uh, anti-spike antibodies. However, we've seen um, an increase in FC gamma receptor signaling, but um, it's nowhere near the full difference that we observed um, in the level of anti-spike antibody binding. So we think that um, while these in vitro results are very interesting, um, in vivo results um, or in vivo studies are warranted. Um, with the important caveat that with HIV and Ebola, um, there are in vitro correlates that have not panned out um, in vivo with ADE effects. 
So in summary, um, FC gamma receptor activation in uh, viral infections, we've seen that efficient FC gamma receptor activation correlates with the IgE-mediated control and clearance of infections in vivo. Um, however, with some pathogens such as dengue, um, enhanced uh, IgG-FC interactions may actually exacerbate disease. Um, with uh, COVID-19, we've seen that um, anti-spike antibody levels correlate with um, disease severity scores in uh, convalescent individuals, um, and also high levels of FC gamma-3 and FC gamma-2 um, activation correlate with higher anti-spike levels in both convalescent and severe hospitalized individuals. So uh, lastly, I'd just like to take a moment to uh, acknowledge uh, some of the people doing this fantastic work that we've been doing um, at i Biologics. So the cohort samples were gathered and consented through um, our company, i Biologics, and this project was spearheaded by our uh, chief scientific officer, Jose Luis Garrido, uh, with help from um, our, our great staff of Felipe, Nicole, Sarah, and um, Sheila. I'd also like to thank our collaborators, Sarab Mahandru at Mount Sinai for um, the hospitalized sample, as well as our collaborator, Mary, uh, Maria Ines uh, Baria and uh, Mario Calvo, who are currently collecting more samples for us to process. And I'd like to give a special thanks to all of our blood donors. Thank you.